Good evening, uh, one and all. My name is Adam Jogi. I'm the Mayor of Haringey, as you can tell uh, by the bit of bling around my neck. Um, and I ought to start this evening by just confirming I am indeed in Hornsey, uh, in the People's Republic of Haringey, despite the uh, lovely green background behind me, which was a, a rare sunny day in, in Northern Ireland uh, on a family holiday uh, a little while ago. When I say a little while ago, of course, it's the last year, so it was about 18 months ago. But as I say, uh, I'm Adam Jogi, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to chair this really important session uh, this evening. Uh, we are joined by local GP, Dr. Fola Akuntunde Eden, NHS Haringey Prescribing Advisor, Isaac Quorn, Deputy Head of Medicines Management at NHS Haringey, Effa Morty, and Public Health Consultant at Haringey Council, Damani Goldstein. And uh, tonight they'll be able to share their experiences, uh, their thoughts, and their advice. Uh, and particularly in answer to any concerns that local people have uh, this evening. Uh, now, we'll all know that local lockdown restrictions are gradually being lifted, and we saw a recent um, relaxation on the 29th of March, which yesterday, in fact, um, where people are now able to come together in groups of up to six or, or two households. And as we're starting to work our way through the four-step roadmap that was announced by the government uh, last month. Our children and young people are back at school. Outdoor sports activities are now back taking place. And as I said, the rule of six applies when people gather outside. Now, of course, it's nice, uh, well overdue, I know, for many of us to be reunited with our friends and our family after so long. But it's important that we proceed with caution. The coronavirus has not yet disappeared. It still remains a huge threat to our community. So please continue to follow the guidelines Pace, excuse me, hands, face, uh, and space. Now, around one in three who have COVID-19 don't know they have it. So I'd like to urge you to attend one of the four asymptomatic testing centres uh, that are here in Haringey. They are located at 48 Station Road in Wood Green, just down from the council's HQ, a Tottenham Community Sports Centre, the Tottenham Green Pool and Leisure Centre, and the wonderful and iconic Alexandra Palace. Now, during the last year and the lockdown, I've spent, um, since my election as mayor of Haringey in October 2020, uh, lots of time focused on the vaccination effort uh, in our borough, but also making sure that we encourage as many people to take the vaccine when they get the call. Uh, my sister and brother, uh, both of whom are younger than me, uh, say I've turned into a bit of a preacher because uh, it's the one thing that I go on about uh, whenever I'm at a family function or uh, on Zoom or um, on the phone. Or, or when um, uh, tweeting uh, or using social media. And that's because it's so vital, because the vaccination effort affects everybody in our community. And the more people who take the vaccine, the more people that will be protected and the faster we'll be able to get back to normal. And my visits to the vaccination centers and I uh, declare an interest. I've been uh, a volunteer at one of the vaccination centers in Haringey almost every week since January. And it's been beyond amazing and inspiring to see the tireless work of our NHS staff and so many local volunteers working to get Haringey vaccinated. And uh, it, it's, um, as I say, it's beyond amazing. And, and, and so if, uh, if I can make a plea, if anyone has spare time, who's watching this, uh, this call uh, and, and this meeting, uh, and you're able to, and you feel safe and, and, and well enough to do so, then please think about volunteering because the more people volunteer, uh, the more effort uh, and power behind the elbows. Now that said, and all the wonderful stuff we are seeing with our vaccination uh, program here in Haringey, I'm still concerned, and I know many others listening tonight, and hopefully we'll hear from you very shortly, are concerned by the low vaccine uptake rates in particular ethnic minority groups. And there's a particular concern around the black and minority ethnic group uh, community here in Haringey. And it's important to me uh, as your mayor, but also um, as a fellow citizen, that everybody gets the vaccine when it's their turn. It's safe, it reduces the risk of serious illness from COVID-19, and fundamentally it saves lives. My girlfriend, uh, Haringey's Meris, um, currently is uh, on the ICU ward in the Whittington. She's a nurse there, and she's been working with many of her colleagues flat out over the last year or so, helping save those people who have very sadly um, taken the virus so badly that hospitalization has been required and she'll be home at some point uh, tonight when her shift finishes but I know from listening to her experiences and her stories just how important the vaccine has been in reducing and alleviating some of the burden and pressures 
that uh, ICU and the NHS more generally have been facing. So it's not just about saving us, it's not just about helping your family, but it's also about taking the pressure off the NHS. And if the last year hasn't shown us um, how vital, how powerful, how uh, loved and effective our National Health Service is, I don't know what more we could do. Tonight's sessions uh, is the perfect platform for you as local people to raise your concerns and to have them addressed by some wonderful and experienced NHS professionals. It's also an opportunity um, for uh, everybody to access factual information about the vaccines so that you can then take that back to your communities and also to your families. There are also some great resources on Haringey's website, the NHS pages and www.gov.uk. So you can, you can visit these sites at any time to receive the most up-to-date and accurate information, but you can also then share and forward on to other people. And I should also say I'm a counsellor in uh, Hornsey, but if you do have questions around the response to the vaccination, excuse me, the response to the corona crisis in our borough and people who need and require extra assistance and support, get in touch with your counsellors. That's what we are here to do. We are part of the puzzle of making sure that we get ourselves through this crisis. So please use us. Uh, you know, make sure you get your worth out of us because we are here to help um, support the wonderful work that our NHS staff uh, and professionals are doing. Now, there's one big question that I've had put to me uh, by many people um, recently. In fact, I had a conversation with a resident here in Hornsey just last night. And that's around how can we approach and tackle vaccine hesitancy in our community? So I'll give you this story. I uh, was walking down Tottenham Lane, which is in the middle of my district, uh, a stone's throw from the house I grew up in, where my mum and dad still live today, and a, a few stones throw from where I live. And I was bumped into a, um, a woman who, uh, whose children I went to school with. She's from Uganda. She's in her early 60s. And the first thing I said to her was, hello, insert name, have you had your vaccine yet? And she looked a little bit sheepish, and she said, oh, I will do it at some point, I will do it at some point. And I said, although you have uh, great skin and look very young, uh, I think uh, from what I can recall, you're probably uh, above uh, 50. Uh, so therefore your time and your, the call on you to have your vaccine will have certainly come by now. What are you waiting for? And her response to me, and I, I was walking with Alison actually, and, and it was quite interesting watching this ICU nurse listen to the hesitancy live, right? And um, uh, this neighbor and resident of mine said, oh, well, I was once very sick with the flu jab, and so therefore I'm not sure I should take the vaccine because then I'm going to be sick again. And Alison, who's a very calm and quiet and um, respectful person, jumped in and said, I tell you what, uh, getting COVID-19 will make you feel far sicker than catching the flu or any impact that the flu jab, which ultimately protected you, would have. And so clearly um, I was really struck, and as I was preparing and thinking about tonight's webinar and, and what I was going to say and, and the issue that I wanted to raise uh, as mayor, um, I, I thought you couldn't have more of a convenient conversation to have, and I swear uh, to God, it generally happened. Uh, I think it was outside number 45 Church Lane, if you're really interested. Uh, and um, I thought that that highlighted just how much more we have to do, both to um, reassure people, uh, to carry people with us, and to also help uh, move them into a space where they feel comfortable getting the vaccine. And I ultimately concluded by saying, uh, not only do I know where you live, <laughs> uh, I'm also very happy to uh, wear my chain and take you to the vaccination centre, if that would help uh, inspire and motivate you to, to take it. Because as I said to that, that particular resident, and I say to all those listening, and I know that the uh, NHS professionals on this call will reiterate this point, you save lives, you protect yourself and your families and the whole community by taking the vaccine. So uh, fundamentally, for all of the fears and concerns, many of those are legitimate. We fully understand that and they'll be addressed by our panel tonight. But fundamentally, just think about this is about helping, helping your neighbours, helping your families and protecting yourselves. So with that, I'm going to go straight into uh, a short presentation with our wonderful panel. And I'll come to Damani Goldstein, uh, who, as I said, is a the Haringey um, Council uh, uh, Public Health Team. So Damani, I'll go over to you and then we'll work our way through the panel. So Damani, good evening and welcome. Just unmute yourself, buzzword. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mayor. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening um, on such a lovely, beautiful day. So I'm a consultant in public health for Haringey Council. My role is to and protect and improve the health of the residents of Haringey. 
And we're working hard with the NHS partners, lots of community groups um, on the COVID vaccine rollout as part of this role. Um, a major aspect of this is this type of engagement work to listen to people, hear what questions and concerns people have, and to provide the information people need to make their own decisions about the vaccines. Really welcome the opportunity to hear from you. Thank you for all of the excellent questions you've raised already. Looking forward to talking through them with you. Um, on the personal level, both my parents have been vaccinated in their, seven, in their 70s, AstraZeneca vaccine, um, really positive experience. And they were really sort of delighted and relieved to have the chance to have the vaccine. Um, so I'll provide a bit of a public health update on the COVID-19 situation here in Harangay and the vaccination program and the progress, progress so far. So uh, in terms of the, um, the mayor talked about some of the, the, the changes since the 10th of March in terms of the roadmap. There are still several restrictions in place. Um, we can't socialize indoors with people we don't live with or we haven't formed a support bubble with. And we continue to work from home where we can. And also it's vital that we continue to get a test and follow stay at home guidance if, if any of us have COVID-19 symptoms. In terms of the cases, over 21,000 people in Harangay have tested positive since March last year. We've been really hard hit as a, as a borough. And more than 500 people have died of causes um, related to COVID-19. Important to highlight the cases and death disproportionately impacted, impacted on residents, families and communities and from poorer groups and from black and Asian backgrounds. Cases are continuing to decrease in Harringay, similar to London and England, very positive. Hospital admissions and deaths from COVID are also falling significantly. We're still seeing moderate numbers of cases in the community. So really to, for us to all to note that the virus continues to pose a serious threat to the health, health and lives of Harringay residents. In terms of the vaccination progress, the program is continuing at pace in Harringay, focused now on over 50s. The ambition is to offer all um, adults a first vaccination by the end of July. Over 50s can now book online, search for NHS COVID vaccine or call 119. So we strongly encourage anyone who is now eligible and hasn't had their vaccine yet to book an appointment. Over 70s who have received one dose of the vaccine will start to be invited for their second dose. You can hear my, um, my son in the background there. So the main route for vaccination remains the primary care sites at Lordship Lane and Bounds Green Medical Center and the mass vaccination center at Hornsey Neighborhood Health Center. We work on further pharmacy locations and then also outreach sessions and access to vaccinations um, for people who are housebound by, by sort of going to them. In terms of the vaccination progress, more than 30 million people in the UK have had at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. More than 70,000 70, Harangay residents have had at least one dose of a vaccine. To start with, with the most vulnerable groups, people who are older or with underlying clinical vulnerabilities, uptake is around 80% for the first vaccine dose in people over the age of 70, really positive. There are important gaps, as mentioned by the mayor, in uptake among, among different ethnic groups. These gaps are closing. We can see the real movement, people changing their minds, people realizing the benefits. And um, the lowest uptake of the vaccination is by people from black ethnicities. This is also the group which has the biggest, biggest rise in uptake in the last four weeks, and now over 60%. Really good news, we continue to have these sort of discussions and partnership working. And um, also to mention that even though the vaccine is now sort of part of our lives, an opportunity that we have to help protect ourselves, our families, our communities, even once we've had the vaccine, we need to still continue to follow the public health guidance around hands, face, space, and sort of fresh air, staying outside wherever we meet with people at this, at this present time. The vaccine prevents severe illness, but like all medicines, no vaccine is completely effective. So those who've received the vaccine should continue to take recommended precautions to avoid infection. Really important. And we've seen that um, from other countries, also here in the UK, where people have not continued to follow the guidance straight after having the vaccine, there have been, there have been cases. So just to make sure that we, the guidance is still, is still adhered to, even after vaccination. We don't yet know how much the vaccine stops COVID-19 from, from being transmitted. Um, the early signs are encouraging, but because we don't have a full picture on that, it's really important that we still maintain that, that, that those safety measures even after vaccination. I'll hand over to my colleague, Effa Morty, um, 
on the pharmacy side to give you a further update. Thank you. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Effa, and I'm a pharmacist, and I work for um, this um, clinical commissioning group based in Haringey. I've been a pharmacist um, supporting the GPs in Haringey for over 20 years. So I um, support them with prescribing advice and um, you know, try to get um, them to prescribe the minimum amount of medicines to keep patients healthy or improve their health. So um, I, I've been, I was told to talk about the history of vaccination and medicines. And um, I, I found that really interesting because when I was looking at it, I knew that um, it's documented that um, an African slave introduced uh, a doctor to it. But I found out a bit more because I was going to speak to you this evening. And so in my opinion, uh, vaccination is one of the medicine's miracles. And although um, Dr. Uh, Edward Jenner, who was around from the 1700s to mid 1800s, was um, described as the father of vaccination, it was documented that um, vaccination has been um, part of history for centuries in uh, other areas, for instance, um, in Africa, in Europe and in Asia. And um, there's a story of um, a slave who was in Boston and he was owned by a master called um, Meha. And um, he, when, the, um, when the smallpox um, you know, pandemic hits Boston, um, this, the slave told um, his master that um, he was inoculated as a child and he showed him the scar. So his master went and did some research and found that, yes, um, they do it in Africa and Asia. And then he became a campaigner because to inoculate people in um, his area. But again, he, he was met with a lot of resistance from um, the people in the area. And what amused me most is that um, Although he became a campaigner, the people were so against him. In his own words, he said the people raised a horrid clamor. And part of um, you know, the, the problems they complained about was their rage came from the fact that inoculation might spread the disease, um, that the knowledge of the bubonic plague that was grown in France was uh, you know, making them even more scared. Um, they, they said, um, why would they, they had this outrageous um, fury that um, we were into, they, they were interfering with what God had planned for them. And also there was a racial tone to it. They said, not only was the method foreign, but it was coming from an African. <laughs> and they accused them, um, they accused his master of having um, Negroish thinking or thoughts. And then also they compared inoculation to what we would now call terrorism. So thinking of all these things, you know, it's so similar to what's going on now because the same thing you hear in social media, you know, people are sending all these messages around. And, you know, when people are hesitant, this is what normally happens. Anyway, so the result was that um, half of the population of Boston um, got infected. That was around 11,000 people. And another doctor who actually believed in what Mayha was talking about decided to uh, inoculate his son and all his slaves. And uh, based on, on that, they found out that um, uh, 11, um, that um, one in seven people who acquired the smallpox naturally died. But for he, him and his family, one in 40 people died. So afterwards, people started accepting the treatment. And also, what was quite interesting was that um, slaves who bear the mark of what they call the uh, variolation, they, they went for a higher price at the time because they knew that they were less likely to die from uh, being infected. So, so these, are, these, are, these are things that are, are not unusual. It's very usual for people to have hesitancy against vaccination. But when we think about uh, the number of people we've vaccinated now, and also one, one really important thing that we, we should be thinking about now is, in the UK, we don't seem to be en entering a third wave Whereas in Europe, we are, you know, and in the US, it's creeping up slowly because they've now got our variant, which is highly transmissible. And, and we, because we have 
vaccinated most of our vulnerable, so most of the elderly, those who are um, clinically vulnerable and have un other underlying um, conditions, right now in hospitals, when you go into hospitals, that's not the population who are being admitted. It's the people who are not being vaccinated. So you can see that the vaccines are really, really working. And what worries me is when we, we're now going through the pathway of coming out of lockdown and, you know, because we, we had vaccination, we had the social distancing and we had lockdown. So that's what's brought our numbers down. That's what's brought the death rates down. But as we come out, those of us who are not vaccinated, we will be put at risk again and the numbers can start climbing up. So in my opinion, you know, although I don't advocate people take a lot of medicines, I rather tell my friends and families how to make like lifestyle changes so that they can come off their medicines. I am really for the vaccine. My mother who's 78 has been vaccinated. My brother who, who was eligible has been vaccinated. And my children, one who has a heart condition and my daughter who has asthma, they've both been vaccinated as well. So I, I would advocate that and say, consider people should consider getting vaccinated. Okay, I'm handing over to Isaac now. Um, thank you, Eva. Um, so my name is um, Isaac Isaac Kwam. I also work, I work with Eva. I'm a pharmacist, and I also work with uh, directly with GPs and advise them on the uh, choice of medication and that kind of thing. Um, I've been asked to talk on um, the safety and efficacy of the COVID vaccines. And um, um, it's quite a broad topic, but I would try my best to make it as simple as possible. So um, we all know that um, at least um, a year ago, we were wondering how we're going to get ourselves out of this problem um, with uh, COVID. We're not sure there was no cure. Uh, people were dying. Um, pharmaceutical companies were working on developing vaccines. Um, but then the question was, how quickly could we develop those vaccines and how safe could those vaccines be and would they work in our populations? Um, what has happened is that within a short time, these companies were able to produce these vaccines, submit them for uh, regulatory approval, and then these vaccines are available and are being used in our communities. They've been used in the UK since um, December, the first week or so in December. And the good news is now we have data, real life data on patients who have been vaccinated within the UK. That will tell us how effective the vaccines are and how safe they have been. Um, the trials that were done were involved um, patients from all ethnic groups and then from ages of about 16 to, um, to old, to very old. And they were done across the, the whole world. Um, and this, this information was submitted to the regulatory bodies and then examined before um, the vaccines were approved for use within the country. Now, these national bodies, so several national bodies have actually looked at this information have, and have authorized the vaccines before they can be used. Um, the data from these trials have been examined and have shown that they were safe, the vaccines were safe, and then they can, they are, they can actually work against the 23rd of March. More than 475 million doses of COVID have been vaccines have been delivered worldwide. Um, the main side effects of um, the vaccine itself are very, very minor. The usual things you will get if you take any vaccinations. I'm sure most of us have had vaccines. So swelling and pain around the ingestion site, fatigue, fever, headache, aching leaves, and the kind of thing that you would treat with um, paracetamol. Um, there have been isolated cases of severe event, uh, effects like allergic shocks, which can be handled by uh, uh, the, or the staff at the vaccination sites and a few other cases that I might go in late, I'm going to go on, discuss later. Um, the long-term effects 
cannot be evaluated actually at the moment because there's not enough time. We haven't had enough experience with the vaccines yet. Um, but the data as of up to date, the information is being monitored and then uh, we have about three months data. But to be honest, given the known risk of COVID perhaps, um, and then what harm it can cause in the long term, perhaps having the vaccine is a safer option than waiting to be infected by, by COVID. Um, I will hand over to Fola at, at this stage. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fola Akintunde Eden. I'm a GP in Haringey, Tottenham. I've been in Tottenham for, as a GP for over 20 years, and I've been a doctor for much longer. Um, my surgery, my patients from my surgery have been particularly hit a lot and affected by, pay, um, by COVID. Um, I've had a lot of patients who've died. I've had a lot of patients who have contacted it. Some have done quite well, recovered very well. I've had some who've had the effect of the COVID for months down the line. So I'm quite passionate about the COVID vaccine. I've been told to talk on the current feelings and attitudes um, towards the vaccine, especially in the Black Asian minority group, and also to talk about fertility and pregnancy. We all know we've all been around for this all year and we've all heard it in the news. And I'm sure we're all aware of someone close to us or friends or colleague who's been affected by COVID and who has been quite unwell by COVID. When the virus came out initially, we thought, we didn't think that we'll still be here a year later. The way I tend to look at COVID now is like an invisible war. And unfortunately, the only thing we have to fight against this invisible war is the vaccine. COVID has affected disproportionately people from our community, the Black, Asian ethnic minority. And they're the ones that have been quite unwell. They're the ones that have di been disproportionately died as well. So I do understand um, people's fears and concerns because historically there's been issues in the past. But what I can say is I've got the vaccine. My parents back in Nigeria, Lagos, have got the vaccine. In fact, they fought to get it. And that's how, I mean, they, they, my father is in his 80s, my mom's in the late 70s, and they had got the AstraZeneca vaccine back in Nigeria. And they are well. Um, I understand the skepticism. The vaccine has, I mean, Isaac's told us, it's been tested on everybody, Black, Asians, Hispanics, and all white people. And it is safe. Obviously, it's a new vaccine and people are worried about the fact that how can a vaccine come out so quickly in short a short time? And the reason why that's happened is A, money was thrown at it, all the scientists down stopped what they were doing and faced the vaccine. And the data out there is safe. In terms of fertility, I've heard out there that people are worried about whether it affects your fertility. It doesn't. It doesn't affect your fertility whatsoever. In fact, during the Pfizer trials, there have been a few people that got pregnant while they were on the trial and the vaccine did not affect them. So if you're planning on getting pregnant, ideally we do say have the vaccine beforehand if you need, if you're one of the um, vulnerable people, but if you do get pregnant shortly afterwards, so far we've not found any effect in it. The way to look at it is one has to weigh and balance the risks. COVID infection is deadly. 
Some people do well, some people have no symptoms, some people don't do so well. So if you weigh that risk, and we know that if you're pregnant and you contact COVID, you do worse than others in terms of it can be quite deadly or you could end up in hospital in ITU and become quite unwell. So being pregnant, if you're in a vulnerable group, it's still worth having a discussion with your GP to have to weigh and balance the risks of catching COVID and being unwell to the potential or not confirmed risk of having COVID in pregnancy. So far, we feel that it is safe in pregnancy because there have been people who've got it and got pregnant and they were okay and they realized they were. And so we will advocate that. So please have a chat with your GP. It is safe breastfeeding as well in breastfeeding. There's been no risk to babies or mothers who are breastfeeding. So I implore you to please go out there and get your vaccine. So being it doesn't affect fertility, it doesn't stop you from getting pregnant. If you're planning to get pregnant and you're in the vulnerable group, it's advisable to get your vaccine now and hopefully get the second one before you get pregnant. But if you do get pregnant before the second one, discuss it with your GP to have as to whether is you should have the second one. But studies, like Isaac said, we are looking at the data continuously. And so far, as far as we know, it is safe in pregnancy, safe breastfeeding. And I'll run this up by saying, we are the ones that are most affected. We're the ones being ill. We're the ones dying. We're the ones ending up in the hospital. Yes, things are better now. The infection rate has gone down, but we still have to stay safe. So even if after you get the vaccine and the whole idea of the vaccine is not so much to stop you from having the infection. That's why we still say, keep your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, but it's stopping you being seriously unwell at needing to go into the hospital. And some people recover very well from COVID, some people don't. I've got patients six months down the line who are still having the effect of their COVID infection and have not still been able to go back to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Doctor, and, and thank you to uh, all the panelists for their uh, initial contributions and, and remarks. And I know for all of those who are watching, you'll have listened and heard from people who've been on the front line or supporting the effort more widely and there are no better people than uh, the four folks you've just listened to uh, tonight and and Dr. Well if I can just say that the point about breastfeeding is a great one. Uh, one of my colleagues, Councillor Power Amit, gave birth uh, last May and there's a beautiful little girl and she recently had her vaccine uh, having had you know some concerns, I'm sure she won't mind me saying because she's tweeted about it, uh, having had some concerns um, about what it would mean as a breastfeeding mother, but had a conversation with the doctor. The doctor was very clear, her GP was very clear that, you know, there, as you've just been, that there are no obvious signs that there's anything that would uh, lead to saying it's not safe for uh, breastfeeding mothers. And so she had her vaccine and, you know, actually it's having that conversation. And, and that's part of what both tonight's about, as well as um, more, more specifically, when you have your private conversations with your um, GPs and, and other health professionals, it's about having that chat, it's raising the point, it's addressing any issues you have, and it's also listing the information and the facts that you get uh, put back to you. So thank you uh, very much indeed, folks. Right, so uh, this evening was in many ways, uh, uh, well, both about to listen from the experts, uh, but also for people uh, out in uh, across Haringey to raise their concerns. And so if we're gonna break it down into three aims, the first one would be to provide an update on the uh, vaccination program rollout in Haringey. Second bit to answer the questions that uh, residents have sent in already. And then obviously, as we've heard from our four panelists, it's to look at uh, ensuring that residents have the correct information. So you all feel confident enough uh, to get the vaccine when it's your turn uh, to do so. So I think 
what we'll do now is go to the real meaty and weighty bit of uh, this conversation uh, and go to the questions. Now, we've had a number of pre-submitted questions, uh, which I will put to the panelists and um, to any local uh, person watching. Uh, please feel free also to put a, a question into the chat if you uh, have one, and we'll make sure that we, we come to those too. But let's let's let, let's break them into themes. And, and if we were to look at effectiveness first, so the effectiveness of the vaccine, and you'll have heard a little bit from uh, uh, our panelists earlier, particularly Isaac, who was looking at um, the uh, effectiveness of, of, of the vaccine. Isaac, why don't, why don't I come to you first? Um, how effective are the vaccines? Uh, do they work against all the different variants that people have seen emerge from different parts of the world, been all over the news? Um, and can you still transmit uh, and catch COVID-19 once you've had the vaccine? So three quite weighty questions there, but can you um, give me your thoughts um, on that? Yes. Um, I forgot to say that I've had my vaccines both um, both doses, so I feel very, very, very confident when I get when I step out of the house now. Um, yes, can they act against that? They, they so far, we have with three uh, main uh, variants have been identified of, of concern have been identified. I mean, it's normal for viruses to mutate. That is a constantly change. And sometimes that change can make the virus more difficult to treat. And other times it can make it easier to treat actually. Um, the three, of the three that have been identified so far of being, of, being of, of some concern to us, the one that is in the UK seems to respond to the current vaccines that we have. Because um, it seems to be the main one that is within the community now, and still the incidence of um, COVID is, is going down with the vaccinations that we've had. So that seems to be responding. Um, the other two, which are the South African and then the Brazilian ones, I think studies are still ongoing. That hasn't been determined yet. And it's the reason why the government is, I think, um, pursuing a policy of uh, following up on any of those cases that they find within the community. The vaccines themselves are extremely, extremely efficacious. I mean, if you compare to other vaccines, these are you're looking at 95% patients. When I mean, if you if you are vaccinated, the chance of you catching or transmitting or falling very ill from the vaccine is is is, is less than five five percent, which is extremely extremely good. Um, what was the other one? Did I miss? The last bit of the question, uh, Isaac, was, are you still able to catch COVID-19 once you've had the vaccine? Yeah, that is still, um, the, the, the data will suggest so, but even if you get infected, vaccinated and you get infected, um, the vaccine makes the effect of the, the condition very low, so you may not get hospitalized, or even if you get hospitalized, it might not be a very severe COVID that you normally will suffer from if you had not been vaccinated. So yes, um, you may be able to catch COVID, you may be able to spread it even though you've been vaccinated, but the protection it offers you is one of the milder form of the disease. Yeah. Thank you, Isaac. I think that's a really important thing for those watching to remember. Yeah. No one's saying that the vaccine will solve all of our ills and it'll be over tomorrow. But what it does do, it protects you, protects your family, it protects those you work with, protects those you come into contact with when you're getting your groceries, when you're collecting your prescriptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what it does, it, it provides that sort of shield um, to uh, prevent any real serious uh, harm, hospitalization that we've seen and death that we've seen from so many uh, people um, across across the world, very sadly, in the last in the last year. Well, thank you, Isaac, that's very helpful. Um, yeah. Damani, why don't we come, come to you and look at um, immunity? So is, uh, is vaccine immunity better than natural immunity? Because you hear people talk about, and I know that this from, from some of my own uh, people in my, my life, who say, well, I had COVID, so therefore uh, I've got antibodies. Uh, I'm all right. I don't need to have the vaccine because if I've had it once, there's no way I can get it again. So is vaccine immunity better than natural immunity? No. The answer to the question is no. Vaccine immunity is better than natural immunity. The reasons why I say that, 
we do not yet know how long natural immunity um, to, to, um, would last. And there seems to be quite a lot of individual variation. There have also been cases of people reinfected with, with COVID-19 um, after really having, having had the virus. So vaccines can stimulate a much stronger immune response than natural infection. Um, so which is why we still offer vaccines to people who've had COVID-19 in the past. So this is why, um, because they will induce a more sort of effective and longer lasting immunity than that produced by natural infection, it's really recommended that everyone take the vaccine so that if someone's immunity after the disease is absent or low, it can be boosted. Also really important to note that when infected, you become infectious to other people around you and you can spread the disease. Infection poses a serious risk to your health, potentially making you very ill and causing long-term health effects as Dr. Foley discussed in relation to some of her, her patients who are still suffering many, many months later. Um, we're still understanding the long-term health consequences of COVID-19. So the vaccination, as, as opposed to the, the, the level of immunity you might develop by, by having the virus naturally, it lets you build up immunity in a safe and controlled way without becoming ill with COVID-19. So the answer to the question is no. Um, vaccine immunity is much better than natural immunity for your for your safety. Thanks, Damani. That, that's a really important point, isn't it? Because uh, lots of people, um, as I said earlier, are saying, well, if I've had it, therefore I'm not going to get it again and I'm going to be fine. Actually, what's increasingly clear, you have it once, there's nothing stopping you getting it again. And without the vaccine, you don't have the protection to stop it getting so severe, you could be hospitalised or worse, even lose your life. So um, although you may think, um, it's smart or, or safe to say, well, I've had it once, therefore um, I can not wear a mask, I can do what I want, I can pretend it's all going to be okay. Actually, you are putting yourself and those close to you, those who rely on you, um, at serious risk because you haven't got that level of protection that the vaccine could provide. So that's a really important point for uh, many people in our community uh, to remember. Now, um, Damani, on, on the sort of immunity point more generally, when I used the example earlier on of my neighbour, who said I'd had the flu jab, so therefore um, I, uh, and I was very sick, so therefore I'm not gonna have this one. That's clearly alluding to concerns around the impact on her immune system and her body and how she can, um, uh, how she'd respond to the vaccine and what, what impact that may have. So um, can, can the vaccine compromise your, your natural immunity or your no. immune system, I should say, your immune system, excuse me? No, um, vaccines boost your immune system response by priming your immune system to respond more powerfully if, um, if you encounter the virus in real life. So some people may feel symptoms such as fever or muscle aches after the vaccine. Those are due to your body's immune response and not, not an infection. So those are signs that your body is responding. Um, we hear the question a lot about um, concerns, for example, of parents about what if um, my child has several different vaccines, will that, um, be too strong for their immune system. When in fact, um, what we know from the research is that vaccines um, comprise only a small fraction of the sort of pressure on, on an immune system for, for a child who, experience, who are experiencing all kinds of different um, sort of antigens just through their normal life. Um, and the range of studies have shown that actually, even if a child, um, much smaller and more vulnerable, um, receives several vaccinations, they have a either a similar or an even lower risk of unconnected infections in the following period. So we know from research from, from many, many decades about vaccinations, the vaccines do not um, compromise our immune system. They boost our immune system to respond to that particular um, infection against which they're targeted, and they don't undermine our immune system more generally or, or, or in any way impact on our ability to respond to other infections. Thank you. That's that's a really that's a really important point. So far from many of the you know legitimate, no one's no one's suggesting that people aren't right to have concerns or raise questions. But many of those concerns around the impact that the the vaccine that would have on the immune system have actually got it wrong in a sense because actually it boosts you and it makes it more likely that your body's going to be able to fight back against the virus, therefore reducing the risk of hospitalisation, reducing the risk of a serious um, uh, uh, experience of COVID-19 or it taking root on, on your body. And, you know, I think the, the important thing to say here, and I, by no means am I a clinician, although living with a, an ICU nurse, you do hear a little bit more about the uh, the background, the facts that go with this. But, um, you know, but by no means 
uh, is is the virus or any of this other scenario going to solve everything tomorrow? But the key message to remember is it helps protect you and your family as you work through uh, this crisis. Um, now, Damani, what's interesting because we talked about the fact that it doesn't it, it, that it boosts your it boosts your immune system. It makes you more likely to be able to successfully fight the virus. How long once you've had the vaccine will that protection last? How how likely are you? You know, is it one? Is it two jabs and then you're done forever? Is it two jabs and we're going to see you in six months time for another one? How long um, does the protection from the two jab vaccines last? The answer is that we're still learning about how long protection from the vaccines last. It's a major issue being studied carefully by scientists. Um, they, they have warned that it may take some time before they can definitively say how long vaccine protection will last. And there may be a need for a booster every year. Um, part of the consideration there is also about how effective the vaccines are against different variants of the virus, which we're still learning. One of the things to note, as, as my colleague Isaac, the pharmacist, mentioned before, all the evidence we have so far shows that the vaccines may be less effective at preventing people from showing some um, minor symptoms of, of COVID, but the, but the vaccines that we have are still effective at preventing hospitalization and death. Um, that being said, there is still work in the way of understanding um, how the variants and maybe future variants identified may impact on the vaccine's effectiveness in, in, this, in the real world. Um, so for that reason, there is work underway to develop vaccines tailored to the different variants, which may be used in the autumn as a booster for some of the most vulnerable groups based on their aging clinical conditions. Mm -hmm. So we're still learning about how, how long the vaccine protection lasts, and also boosters need to consider um, the potential for adapting the vaccines to be even more effective against different variants, the ones in circulation now, and future ones that may be identified through the sequencing work that we do um, people have infections. Thanks, uh, Damani. That's a, that's a really important point. Uh, we're, not, we're not through the crisis yet. There's still a little bit to learn, but what we do know, and I'm going to keep going back to it, it can be a broken record, uh, but what we do know is that the vaccine helps protect you now, and it helps ensure that you have a reduced risk of serious uh, illness as a result of COVID-19. So whilst we're still working out whether we need to have a, a, a boost after a year, maybe six months, who knows, that will be confirmed in the period ahead. But what we do know now uh, is that the vaccine will help provide you with the protection uh, that you and your families need. Now, um, let's just move to Dr. Fowler. Now, what advice would we give to those people who, again, have almost linked to those who've said, well, I've had it, so therefore I'm okay. That sort of uh, the, the Dutch courage that you tend to get in a, in a young, young man who says, oh, you know, mom, I'm all right. I don't need to have any medication. I don't take pills. I don't need vitamins. I'm all right. Um, do you need to take the vaccine if you follow a healthy lifestyle? Just unmute yourself for Dr. Fowler. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the short answer is yes, you still need to um, have the vaccine even though you follow a healthy lifestyle. We do advocate you having a healthy lifestyle, so no smoking, exercise, eating well, having a balanced diet, um, eating your regular veggies, fruits, and going um, exercising. But that's good, that's great, I advocate that. But that doesn't protect you, from, it, it boosts your immunity, but doesn't protect you specifically from COVID-19 infection. The only thing that does that is the vaccine. Like I said earlier, it's like a, an invisible war. If you're going to go to war, you need to know who you're fighting with. You need to know what weapons they've got and what you're going to use to fight against them. You can't go, fight, so go into war with someone who's got a nuclear weapon and you go there with a gun. Use something that's equivalent, and the only thing we've got that's equivalent that we can fight the COVID infection with is you having the vaccine. There's the vaccine, and the vaccine. What that would then do is boost your immunity against COVID infection. So if you do come in contact with it, then your your risk of being seriously unwell is reduced. Does that mean don't do a healthy lifestyle? Oh no. I so ask you to go for it. In fact, I want everybody to have a healthy lifestyle. 
I remind myself to go for exercises or at least go for a walk and eat sensibly. Make sure your weight is down. Don't smoke. Exercise. Balanced diet. I advocate that all the time, but it does not replace the vaccine. That's really important advice, uh, Dr. Fuller, because there'll be many people who eat lots of salads, who don't smoke, who sleep well, who don't have lots of caffeine, who, you know, enjoy, I mean, Haringey is blessed with 25% of our, uh, of our land mass as green open spaces. I know many local people watching will enjoy the walks, but that will not protect you against COVID-19. And that's the point. You can go for as many lock, walks as you want, <laughs> uh, uh, for as long as you want, uh, obviously conforming with the uh, public health guidelines uh, from the government, but um, that won't mean you uh, and your body doesn't get a, a bad dosage of um, COVID-19 without the vaccine. Now, Dr. Fellow, there's a question from Yvette Miller-Francis, which is sort of linked to your point around the impact on the body and the protective shield. So if you have no symptoms having had the vaccine, does that mean it's not responding to your body? No, not necessarily. It doesn't. Um, we all re react differently to vaccines. Um, some people would have a vaccine and have no symptoms at all. Some people will have the vaccine and have the side effects to it, which usually last just about 24 hours. So you get a bit of a sore arm, you have a bit of a headache, might even have a bit of shiver or a bit of temperature, but usually last 24 to 48 hours. Most people here probably have children. If you think about it, babies, you take them for their vaccination. When you take them for the vaccination, they get the injection on one arm, you're given a cup or bottle on the other arm. So that's a paracetamol. And that's because the, we know the babies get irritable. We don't know whether it's a headache or the arm is sore. We know if they have a temperature because sometimes they do. That's why we give them a couple. So it's similar with the COVID vaccine. It's a vaccination. It's giving you something to boost your immunity. So yes, you would have a bit of a temperature. You will have a bit of a sore arm. You might have, you might have a headache, might have a bit of temperature, but most, some people don't. So you having it or not having it doesn't mean your immune is not being boosted. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fuller. Yvette, thank you very much indeed for your question. It's a really important one because as uh, Dr. Fuller indicated, uh, each body, well, obviously, <laughs> but each of our bodies uh, and our immune systems and the way our bodies operate will be different. So each person will respond uh, to the vaccine differently, but that does not take away from the level of protection and that layer, that shield that you and your body will have received by receiving your two jabs currently. So. Thank you for raising that very important point uh, because that's a very helpful way of reassuring people that one person may have a headache, one, pay, one person may feel really fluey, another person may feel completely fine uh, and all three of those people will have had the same level of protection and that's the really key point to uh, remember. Now um, let's look at something around safety uh, Dr. Furl and, and I'll stick with you for a moment um, because it sort of links into Yvette's question uh, around the impact that the virus has or doesn't have on people's bodies. So you've, you've sort of touched on it a little bit, but just give us a little bit more on what effects and side effects the vaccine could have uh, on people. Okay. Um, the, most, the first thing first is obviously the pain in the arm, a bit of a swelling, it might be a bit red, it might be a bit sore for a while, but that settles. You might have a bit of a temperature, like I said earlier, a bit of a headache. Some people will feel a bit fluey, so a bit of a body ache, feeling a bit tired, being a bit restless, um, restless, uncomfortable. And that usually lasts just 24 to 48 hours. And what we usually say is take a bit of paracetamol or carpal, preferably, well, paracetamol for adults. And that should help you along. Good. That's very helpful. I, I, I paused just to remember how sweet and tasty Kalpa was uh, from all those years ago, uh, but I, I definitely have not had it in a long time, <laughs> as the grey hairs on my head would testify. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Fuller. Now, Effa, let me, um, let me come to you. 
and let me just put this proposition uh, to you. So I'm allergic to penicillin. Uh, can I have the vaccine? Just unmute yourself when you're ready. <laughs> so there I we go. forgot that I was uh, muted. So yes, you can have the vaccine because uh, there's no penicillin in the vaccine. Um, people who have multi allergies to like um, dust mite, medicine, certain foods, they can all have the vaccine because it, it is safe. The only people who can't have the vaccine are those who are allergic to any of the components of the vaccine. Now, if you have an allergy to components of certain injections that things that they mix normal injections with you would know about it and you know when people ask you oh what are you allergic to you would say straight away oh, i'm allergic to this so it will be picked up if you're allergic to any of the components of the vaccine and the other group of people who can't have the vaccine are those who've had like a severe anaphylactic reaction to any injectable um, uh, medicines. So they can't have the vaccines. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, very, very helpful indeed, uh, Effa. So um, now, it's kind of linked to that in matters because obviously people are concerned and you have to point out that if you do have an allergy component of a vaccine, an existing vaccine or the flu jab or whatever other forms of um, that uh, support or protection is 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 administered in that way. Um, what kind of people shouldn't have the vaccine or can't have the vaccine, or are there any people who can't have the vaccine? So, so currently, so currently, we, we there aren't really any groups of people who can't have the vaccine because even people who are pregnant and breastfeeding who are not in the trials, if they have um, like if they're at risk of exposure or they have underlying clinical conditions, they and um, discuss with their GP and decide to have the vaccine because it has been found that people who are pregnant and those who are breastfeeding have had the vaccine now we're, after we vaccinated so many people in the population and they have been safe. So those people who have underlying clinical conditions that put them more at risk of severe disease from catching COVID if they are if they are either pregnant or breastfeeding, they should be vaccinated after a conversation with their GP about their risks. And there are some people who say, "Well, I, my immune system is suppressed. Um, should I have the vaccine?" And again, although your immune response will be maybe less than someone who has an uh, adequate immune system, it is still recommended that you have the vaccine because you are more at risk of severe outcomes from COVID. So those people should. But so far, anyone who has a, a severe underlying clinical condition, they should be at the front of the queue to get vaccinated because they will be more protected and they will not have severe outcomes because it's that group of people who usually have severe outcomes following infection from COVID. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, Dr. Polo, can I just come back to you very briefly? Because we're talking around um, about sort of people who uh, may have concerns or as uh, Effa just indicated, if you're allergic to something and you could have a conversation with your, with your GP. Can you just explain to us a little bit about the process around receiving your text messages and going to the center? So for example, if you're, if you're a hanging resident who's had a text message saying, please come and book your appointment, or please call X clinic to book your appointment, but you haven't had a chance to speak to your GP, and you go along, for example, to Lordship Lane or to Bounds Green or to Hornsey, you can see someone, can't you? You can talk to a health professional, you can talk for your, your health issues or concerns or fears before you take the jab, can't you? Yes, you can. Um, because the, um, at the vaccine centers, there's usually doctors, there are nurses, there are pharmacists there as well. So they'll be able to advise you as to, obviously they might not have all the information. If you have concerns, there'll be some concerns that they will be able to elevate. If there's some that they can't elevate, they will ask you to have a discussion with your GP. Mm. If you're really worried, especially if you have um, a what really worried about, it's worth having that discussion with your GP 
before going to the centers. But most of the things, if there are straightforward questions, when you go to the vaccine centers, there are people that can help answer those questions if you have specific um, concerns. So don't worry about it. If you can't get through your GP, which sometimes that happens, and you've got a time slot, go along there, have your discussion. There will, there will always be doctors there. There are pharmacists, there are doctors, there are nurses that can help answer your questions. Thank you. I think it's really important just to reiterate that you know, once you get the text message or the letter asking you to book your appointment, you book the day, let's just say April the 1st to 10 o'clock, nothing is put into your arm until you've signed a form agreeing for it to happen. And once you've been able to express all of your concerns through uh, either, as um, Dr. Fellis says, one of the medical uh, clinicians working there, one of the GPs leading the vaccination effort, or indeed one of the pharmacists. And the pharmacists are the folks who put the vaccine together. So without them, uh, we are uh, we we are really um, uh, in in a mess. So all three of the different elements of the clinician offer will be able to address your concern. So if you don't, as Dr. Fuller says, you don't get a, a, an appointment with your your GP, still go, still book it, because nothing will happen to you until you've had that conversation uh, and a chance to raise uh, your issues. Now, um, Fuller, which of the vaccines are more recommended or suitable, for want of a better word? to people who, for example, uh, are diabetic or um, on dialysis or who are currently receiving chemotherapy or uh, radiotherapy. So are, are there any specific, uh, I mean, there's currently two that have been uh, licensed in the United Kingdom, AstraZeneca and uh, Pfizer. But of the two, is there a particular one that people who may be in receipt of uh, other medical um, treatment uh, should take? No, you can take either. So you can take either the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine, there is the both. The both can be used by people who've got diabetes, COPD, the elderly, dementia, those who've got heart problems, kidney problems, those on dialysis. You can, all the groups can use either of the vaccine. There's no difference, okay, in you in which to use. There is not. You can't say that one is specific to one group of people, that both can be used across all the groups of people. And there's no worries with that. We're expecting the um, Moderna vaccine soon as well. And my understanding is that's also quite good. So you can use that. Great, thank you. So, you know, that's very, very clear. Both the vaccines currently licensed in the United Kingdom, the only vaccines available in the vaccination centers where you will be directed to once your letters and your calls come through both of them provide you with the support and assistance you need to build that protective shield around you uh, and your body and to preserve and protect, uh, protect your your health. So, uh, you know, whatever, whether you're one of those really healthy people or whether you are on dialysis and uh, receiving chemotherapy uh, and have been quite ill or very ill, uh, both of the vaccines will give each of those people uh, the support and protection uh, they need. Okay, let's um, keep rolling in because this sort of links into uh, the point around the difference between the vaccines. And obviously lots of people uh, uh, see in a newspaper, this, this vaccine does X or this vaccine does Y, um, or I want Johnson and Johnson, even though it's not available in the United Kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Damani, let me come back to you. Uh, which vaccine, so I'm Adam, I'm 29, uh, I'm waiting for my turn, but I've just put my appointment at um, Brown's Green. Which vaccine will I be offered? The, both vaccines are, are currently in use. Um, in terms of which one people would, would sort of prefer, which one people would choose, um, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation has not advised a preference for either one in any specific group of people on the basis that both give very high protection against severe disease um, and in terms of safety profiles. So it's really about what is about the supply and what is available. So because all of the approved vaccines are highly effective at preventing severe disease and death, and they're all um, valid and, and strong and sort of useful for, for all of us really. Also, one important point to note in terms of the, the comparison between the vaccines is that they weren't tested head to head. And they were tested with sort of diverse populations in different places um, at different times. So there will have been slight differences in the populations, 
And the trials also happen at different times. So how well a particular vaccine performs, it will partly depend on which variants are in circulation when it is tested. So what that means really is that we don't really have such a basis for making a real comparison across the different vaccines. What we do know is that for everything that we've seen so far, and the huge number of people who have been vaccinated, the vaccines have all prevented hospitalizations and deaths, which is the most important outcome. And it's really the reason behind the vaccination program is to protect people from going to hospital, getting severely ill, or um, having the risk of, risk of death. That's very helpful. Thanks, Duani. So the point there is, whatever you offered, take it, because it'll give you uh, the protection uh, you need. Now, um, Effa, Dr. Furness sort of touched on this, but will other vaccines be coming to the UK? So we've got the two licensed vaccines at the moment, AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Uh, Dr. Furler mentioned uh, Moderna a moment ago. That I think, and I believe, uh, was approved for use in the UK, but we haven't seen any um, of that filter down to the vaccination centres yet. So will there be other vaccines coming to be used as we work our way through the rest of the general population? Just unmute yourself. You're very lucky, you see, when I chair council meetings and colleagues uh, 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 start speaking without unmuting, I tend to uh, get them to put some dosh into the Mayor's Special Fund uh, effort. So you... Uh, you better not make this mistake again. You have to be very careful. I'm really sorry about that. Hopefully, that's all right. Donations are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. So, in answer to that, yes, there are um, several other vaccines coming on the scene eventually. The Moderna vaccine, we're hoping we will have some of that um, from next month, and we'll start using that in the UK. And there are other vaccines that, you know, because of the, the, the time it takes to make vaccines, and also, you know, the UK, uh, you know, one thing the government that did really well was they, they purchased and agreed vaccines way back last year in May, when lots of people were umming and ahhing. So even before we knew the vaccines were efficacious, uh, we booked large quantities. In fact, the government has booked more than what we actually need for the population. So in foresight, that maybe some might not be as effective and there'll be some left over, maybe we can give it to other people, but just to make sure that everybody's covered. So we will be getting the Janssen and Janssen uh, vaccine soon. And there's one called Novavax that coming. Uh, we have one called Valneva and GSK is also working on uh, vaccines. And um, the government haven't booked to buy any vaccines from uh, Russia, the, the Sputnik one. But apparently it's really so really like the vaccines are coming up to they, they look like they're all very, very effective. And we were so grateful that they are because, um, you know, if they weren't um, like if they were as effective as the flu vaccine, which is about 50 percent effective, you know, then, you know, that won't be protecting us. But most of them are coming back really, really effective and will soon be awash with all sorts of vaccines to choose from. Good. And, 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 and as we heard earlier, from, from Domani in many ways, um, it doesn't actually matter which vaccine we get, as long as we get vaccinated, because they all do the same thing, uh, which is protect that, put that shield around you and make sure you um, are, are covered. Now, um, Dr. Dr. Fowler, is it true that there's going to be a shortage of vaccines? Now, we, we uh, Effa just quite rightly points out that there, you know, there's a, there's a load of uh, different vaccine suppliers or many producers being working uh, very, very hard. But we, at the same time, we still hear about how there's going to be a, a shortage quite soon. Um, how, you know, what impact will that have on the general population, our younger people who require uh, vaccination, my generation, um, but also uh, those who perhaps didn't get around to booking their appointment or who were worried uh, and wanted to leave a little bit longer and then get to stage now where they could be in a vulnerable category. They now suddenly want the vaccine but it's not available. Is that going to be a concern or will we be all right? I think we'll be all right because one thing I've noticed is that what, one thing the government has done quite well is they have, like Effa said, they have really gone out there and bought a lot of vaccines. Obviously, there are a lot of companies that are producing a lot. So we've got Pfizer, we've got AZ, we've got Moderna next month. We've got a lot of vaccines coming through. I think there's been a lot of fear as to the shortage that, that might happen. I think it's unlikely, I, might, I think it's unlikely that we will have a shortage. 
One thing I've noticed so far, though, is that we have so much vaccine because at the moment we've got the pharmacy in my surgery injecting people. And towards the end, they have a bit left over and they're actually phoning people around and saying, do you want to get your vaccine today? Do you want to get your vaccine? So we are at the moment have more than enough. So I think it's unlikely. I mean, don't cope there. No, of course, yet. of course. But uh, I think it's unlikely we would have a shortage. Sorry, does Damani want to come in? Yeah, Damani, do you want to come in there? From what we understand, we think it's unlikely that there'll be a shortage. And um, based on the, the sort of the large numbers, the different vaccines that have been um, been procured, there's still very sort of quite sensible and, and cautious strategy in terms of buying um, the vaccines that was done sort of early on. So I think that we, we can be fairly confident that, that, that there will be sufficient supply. Thank you. And actually, it's interesting talking about the vaccine because whilst also uh, there's concerns around there being a shortage, uh, there's also concern around uh, countries who, for example, uh, many countries in Europe, they have, uh, what's the word? They've stopped the rollout of particular vaccines. Uh, so take the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example. Uh, there's breaking news today, I believe, and this is a question uh, from uh, the community, that, va that Germany will no longer give the AstraZeneca vaccine to people under 60. Uh, and Canada has suspended it for people under 55 due to quote, blood clotting, but the United Kingdom continues to give it. So uh, this particular resident wants to know, having had her first AstraZeneca jab, um, should she be worried about having the second, Dr. Fowler? Um, so far, we've been told that it's safe. The European Health um, Agency also came out and said it was safe. I know that a few weeks back, Germany actually said they weren't going to vaccinate um, they're over 65 with AstraZeneca and they came back later and said that's not the case. I have not seen the news today so I don't know what the breaking news is for today. But as far as we know and as far as all the trials and studies have shown, AstraZeneca va um, COVID vaccine is safe in all age groups above the age of 16. So from 16 years old and above it is safe, but like I said, uh, or we've all said earlier, the trials are continuing. We are looking at everything and so far so good. Well, so far, there's no reason not to because we have to weigh and balance the risk of contracting COVID-19 in that age group and the potential maybe risk. In terms of the blood clot, the European Health agency came out just last week and disputed that. In the way I would look at it is there would always be people who would have clots, blood clots. There would always be people who have heart attacks. There will always be people who have strokes. COVID vaccine or no COVID vaccine, there would be. But what we've found so far is there has not been an increase in those conditions, in those who have had the COVID vaccine compared to the general population that have not had the vaccine. So the, the advice has, all, has been, and it still is at the moment, is that it does not cause blood clots, increased blood clots, and it is safe to take the AstraZeneca vaccine. Thanks, uh, Dr. Fuller. I mean, I think that question indicates very much some of the impact that news and rumor and political decisions can impact on people uh, feeling safe and comfortable. I think it's really important that you try and, and this is my encouragement to the people of Haringey who are watching this, it's really important that you try and filter through the back and forth. And that's why it's so important that you listen to the NHS staff and volunteers um, and clinicians who are leading the vaccination effort because they will be able to give an objective, holistic, neutral, um, uh, not, and I don't mean to cast aspersions, but I mean it gives you an objective view of what the situation is, um, which is obviously a, a very important um, approach. Look, we've got a couple more uh, questions and minutes because I'm mindful of the fact that it's now quarter past eight. And although it's been a lovely day, I'm sure everyone is hungry and wants to go and have uh, some dinner. So uh, thanks for bearing with us uh, just a little uh, longer. Now, Isaac, um, 
I put this proposition to you. I don't like needles. I, uh, the idea of them make me feel uh, sick and scared and fearful uh, and wanting a lollipop and a sticker when I have uh, gone in uh, to have them. Uh, are there any plans for the development and the production of a vaccine that can be taken in any other way than through a needle? That would be great, wouldn't it? Um, I haven't seen any plans by any company yet to produce um, any a vaccine in any other form. Um, currently, if you are uh, was a needle, needle phobic, um, I think you could get injected at the Whittington Hospital. If I correct me if I'm wrong, at the Whit, is that it? Yeah, 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 yeah. The your, I think your GP can refer you there. I think. Yeah. So if 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 if, if yeah, the person has a problem, all he needs to do is just phone the GP, and then uh, they can make arrangements for him or her to have the person in uh, in the hospital where they are trained personnel to manage the condition. Uh, I've also seen on the news that uh, some people are working on the nasal um, you know, vaccine. Okay. However, having said that, they're working on it now. We don't have that time to wait because you know, any time between now and then, people can catch COVID. So you know, waiting for an alternative is not really a good idea. Yeah, I think that's right. And I ought to just uh, confirm to the people who are watching this, that proposition wasn't necessarily a live uh, reflection of my views. I'd have no personal issues with needles. Um, but uh, I, in fact, so much so, I'd encourage um, uh, all of you, even if you do have a problem, to close your eyes uh, and uh, to uh, count to 10, because uh, from speaking to people who've had it and from volunteering at the clinic myself, uh, beyond five seconds it's been done and dusted in your only way anyway so uh, you'll spend more time worrying about the needle uh, you'll spend more time sitting outside the room you're going to have the vaccine administered to you than you will do with your arm uh, sleeve rolled up and the needle in you so uh, you know be strong uh, is my message to those who are worried um, about needles look last question um Damani, and let me let me come to you on this. I think this is an important one. It's a topical one because lots of people are talking about it, and we're hearing increasingly uh, from government about uh, the rollout and what that means and what things look like next. Are Harrogate residents going to need a vaccine passport? It's not yet clear. Um, we know the national government is considering um, vaccine passports which might be proof of vaccination or proof of a, a recent negative um, COVID test result. Um, there are lots of technical and practical and ethical complexities to vaccine passports, to the concept, um, in terms of changing what people can or cannot do in the UK, such as, for example, can people go to sporting events? Can people go to um, indoor, indoor restaurants, that kind of thing, in terms of how it would be um, administered how it would be how it would be monitored, and the ethical implications that, that might result from changing the access of different groups to particular services. Um, it does seem likely that vaccination will be um, a feature of, of overseas travel, at least to some countries, at least for some period of time. So the implication um, does seem likely to that sort of being vaccinated will affect the kinds of travel people can do. Um, in terms of what it will, what, what the implications will be for um, doing things in different places here in the UK, um, we can't yet say that. We know it's being looked at, and there's a lot of complexity around it, um, but there's no yet sort of settled position about whether it will be implemented or how it might look. That's great, thank you, uh, Damani. I think, uh, you know, in some ways it's great that people are now looking to think about what happens next as we work our way through the crisis, but before we get there, there's still so much more for us to do to make sure that as many of our people are protected, our people, you, the people of Harangay, um, are protected as possible. Look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to all those residents who've been watching, uh, thank you very much indeed. I just want to say thank you to our panel, to Effa, to Dr. Fella, to Isaac, and to Damani, who in their uh, different ways across the health service and across the uh, vaccination effort are working to uh, 
uh, ultimately keep our community alive and well. So it's um, a real pleasure for me to be able to join uh, our four panelists this evening. Keep going. Uh, we appreciate all you're doing uh, to get Haringey vaccinated and uh, we are all very grateful to you indeed. I want to say a couple uh, more things. One, thank you to the council staff who helped um, ensure this webinar could take place. They're working behind the scenes. They're making sure that um, uh, in advance of tonight, I was uh, briefed, uh, but also uh, that the technology worked and that fundamentally our community were able to put their questions. So thank you uh, to, to Jack and to Melissa and to Joel and uh, Nikita and all the other uh, officers who are working uh, uh, beyond uh, hours this evening. And as mayor, I just want to say this to the people of Haringey. Firstly, uh, if you've had your vaccine, thank you. Uh, thank you for protecting yourself. Thanks for protecting your neighbors, your family, uh, and to all those people you come into contact with. And if you haven't had your vaccine, please, when the message gets through to your uh, phone or if the letter arrives on your doormat, uh, please think about doing so because you'll be doing something so important for all of us as we look to work our way through this crisis uh, and beyond. So uh, we still have more to do. We still have further to go, uh, not least in terms of, uh, you know, supporting the NHS staff who are out there day in, day out, doing all they can uh, well above and beyond what they're paid to do uh, to keep our community alive, uh, safe and well. And a little small bit we can do to show our appreciation is by having the vaccine. So please, when you get the call, uh, for your vaccine, please go and, and have it. And lastly, uh, now as the restrictions are starting to uh, weaken or lessen, uh, please still continue to be safe uh, and be smart about how you go about your business because uh, as we've heard from many of the questions uh, this evening, uh, we uh, don't know what necessarily lies in store. We do know that the vaccine will help protect you. We don't know what the years ahead have for us, but what we do know uh, is that with that vaccine, uh, we will be a little bit stronger in responding to this uh, to this deadly uh, crisis. And I suppose I ought to end by reiterating how I suppose across uh, Haringey, all of us, whoever we are, wherever we're from, uh, remain uh, conscious of all the lives that have been lost and how much more we have to do to uh, prevent that happening in the future. So with that, when you get the call, take your vaccine and thank you very much indeed.